Okay, so in the first video about dynamic pigeon, I covered really almost all the, the language. I left out a handful of operators. We'll get to some of those in this video, but this video is mainly going to be about just showing some practical examples of some very simple programming exercises using dynamic pigeon. Uh, out of the gate though, I need to make some corrections because in the first video, I, I'd forgotten, I'd actually changed the language where instead of the append operator, it's called push. Uh, this is to avoid confusion down the line when you learn uh, Go, because in Go, append is a, it's like push somewhat, but it's different. So instead, we're going to call it push. That's how you tack things onto the end of a list in Pigeon. Uh, and then the for deck loop, I explained incorrectly because it, it counts down through the end. It doesn't stop at the last the end value. It it goes through it. So here's what that means. It means if we have for deck i five zero, well the first the first value is not five. It's actually one less than five, uh, and then the last iteration, the value is going to be zero. So, so it's actually doing a test of whether i is less than or equal to this end value. Uh, sorry, greater than or equal to this, less, this last value. And then it keeps iterating while that's true. So only once we get to negative one in this case is the loop going to end. So just want to make that clear. Uh, so our first practical example is um, there's a, a famous programming exercise called FizzBuzz. It's just a little test of, of very basic programming knowledge very basic logic. And what we do in this exercise is we want to print all the numbers from one through 100, including 100, except for the special cases where numbers evenly divisible are evenly divisible by three. Instead, we'll print fizz. For numbers that are evenly divisible by five, we'll print buzz. And for the case where numbers are evenly divisible by both three and five, we're going to print fizz buzz. So say 15 is evenly divisible by three and five. So instead we'll print uh, fizz buzz instead of 15. So, uh, first thing we need to do is obviously we need to iterate through the numbers from 1 to 100. So how do we do that? Well, okay, so here's just a, a main function, a program where we're iterating from 1 uh, up through 100. We could write it like this, where we have uh, a local variable i. It's a counter variable for a loop. Initialize it to 1, because that's the first value we want it to have through the loop. And then the last, to, to make sure this keeps going, well, we're, we're incrementing i here at the end, right? And to make sure this keeps going through 100, we make the condition less than or equal, not less than. If it were less than, it would stop at 99. The last iteration would be 99. But we want it to print 100, so we want it to be less than or equal. So that's one way you could write the loop. Uh, a bit more compact, though, is if we could use for ink. And just the important thing to keep in mind here is that for for ink, it starts with this value. I will have the value 1, but then the condition is keep iterating while i is less than this value. So we actually have to make it 101 so that it will include, it's going to be one one greater than the last value we wanted the i to have, right? So uh, this is how we're going to write our loop. Um, the question is, okay, so how can I test if a number is evenly divisible by another number? Uh, well, one way to do that is if you could get the remainder of division. If you could perform division and what you get back is not uh, the result of division, but the remainder, then you could test if that remainder is zero. So if I divide three by three, the remainder should be zero, right? If I divide uh, six by three, the remainder should be zero. So numbers that are evenly divisible by three, uh, if I, there, there's a remainder of zero when, when we do division. Well, the way the division operator works, uh, the div operator works in Pigeon is that um, it always, it just gives you a single number. It doesn't give you the remainder. There's no remainder, it just gives you a, a, a fractional value. So if you divide, uh, Let's see, three by four, you get 0.75, right? So if you want to get remainder, though, there's an operator called mod, which stands for modulus, which is an, an operation in mathematics that's defined. And it's basically, it's like giving you the remainder of division. It's a little more complicated than that, but for our purposes, that's close enough. So if we do mod n, these, these two variables, n and divisor here, so whatever n is, is divided by divisor, and we get back from this the remainder. Not the result of division, but the remainder. Anyway, so we've defined this function is evenly divisible, and we're going to pass in some number we want to test for what is if it's evenly divisible by something, and whatever number we want to be evenly divisible by, we'll call the divisor. And so we do mod and divisor, and test if the result is equal to zero. That's what this expression is doing, and that's what we return. So this function will return either true or false. So here in main, for example, if we test is evenly divisible with seven for n and three for the divisor. Well, let's see, seven divided by three is two with the remainder of one. So in here, this would return one and one is not equal to zero. So, this, so the function call would return false. So you should see this printed out. You should see seven is, is oops, 
uh, sorry, you this the condition will be false, so we're going to skip down here to the else, and this is what you're going to see printed out. Seven is not evenly divisible by three. Okay, uh, we don't really need. Well, the question is, do we need this function? We'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But for now, just we'll have that function that we've defined here. And now we're going to go back to our loop, which is for inking from uh, I starting at one up two, but not including 101. And we're gonna need two local variables, by three and by five. And we're gonna test is, as we each time we go through the loop, we test if I is evenly divisible by three and store the result in by three. And we test if i is evenly divisible by five, store the result in by five. And now we need to do our printing of, of like fizz, buzz, and fizz, buzz. So there's actually four possible cases. It's, it's a mutually exclusive choice between four possibilities. Print fizz, print buzz, print fizz, buzz, or print the number itself, whatever i is currently. So uh, this is the case where, a number, where the number i is evenly divisible by both three and five, and we're going to print out fizz, buzz. Otherwise, if just by three is true, then we print out fizz, and if otherwise, if by five is true, then we print out buzz. And if none of those things are true, for a number like two, which is not evenly divisible by three or five, then we're going to print it out. So this is actually a working solution for FizzBuzz. Um, there's a debatable point of style here of do we really need this function here? Do we Should we have this function or just take this expression and plug it in place? Is this really all that complicated? Well, there, there are competing schools of thought about this question. Um, in many cases, it'll seem useful to define functions, even if they do something very simple, because instead of having maybe a confusing expression where you scratch your head and look at it and say, well, what is that about? Instead, it'll have a more descriptive name. On the other hand, it uh, is sometimes annoying to deal with a bunch of little functions or it's just not worth the bother. So, so you know, arguably, you might just want to write the, the code this way, where uh, you directly put um, these expressions, instead of having a separate function, we just uh, plug this expression in with, and, and just manually plug in the different values. This would be just totally equivalent. That's a stylistic question. Um, but also here we've changed something where this code is no longer correct because what we had up here, we had the test for by three and by five, that was first. Um, here we're changing this around, we put the by three uh, test first, and now the code is wrong because what's going to happen in the event that if for a number that like say 15 which is evenly divisible by both 3 and 5 in that scenario what's going to happen is this condition is going to be true so we're going to print out fizz and then skip over the rest of the stuff we want it to print out fizz bus because this this should be true as well but because this condition comes first uh, you know the, the order of the, the, these conditions are tested top to bottom right if you have a, an if with a bunch of elifs and so in some cases like this one, it's going to matter what the, uh, what the order is. Because in some cases, multiple conditions can be true. And whichever one comes first, that's going to be the one that executes. So when you solve FizzBuzz, make sure to put the, this test first. OK, here's finally something that's actually practical. A very common thing you want to do in code is take a list and extract out a range of elements from that list. So like you have a list of 10 elements and you want to get back another list which has all the same elements from say like index two up to say like index seven. You want to extract out a sublist. And so we're creating a function here called sublist which uh, does exactly this. And it takes uh, as its first argument a list which we're just going to call A. Uh, and then it takes also an integer for the start index, we'll call that start, and an integer for the end index, we'll call that end. And we're gonna get back, what we want back is a new list with all the same elements from start up to index, but not including end. So uh, so say if start is two and end is six, then we're gonna get all the elements from index two up through, but not, uh, index five. So we're not including six, end is one past the last element we want. There, there's a reason for that. This is a common convention where you specify, when you specify ranges of things, the last index is not inclusive. It's it's one past. That's, that, it works out to make uh, common idioms in code, common patterns in code, just a little more compact. Um, it's something you just kind of have to see for yourself of, of why that's convention. Anyway, so looking through the logic here, well, well here, I'll just demonstrate some calls. You have, uh, we're gonna create some variable A that's gonna store a list. It's just a coincidence here that the list is stored in variable A it has nothing to do with this A here, right? This is a totally separate uh, variable of a separate function, right? They just, it's a coincidence that they don't have to be called the same thing. 
And we have a variable a, we're just going to store a list of uh, strings that are just uh, letters of the alphabet. So A, B, C, D, E, F, that's uh, six elements. And we want, we're going to get a sublist of a. And if we specify starting index zero and end index four, then we're going to get back a list of a, b, c, d. So it's a list, you know, a is at index zero, b is at index one, c is at index two, and d is at index three. And that's where we stop one less than the number specified here. We don't go to four, we stop one before it. And then likewise, sublist a two, six, well, it's starting at index two, which is c, and ending at index five, which is f. Etc. So I, I won't go through the rest. Well, okay, so here's an example. If we say two and two, then we get back an empty list. If the end index is less than the start value, then we get back also an empty list. Okay, so looking at the logic in the function, uh, we create another local variable, which we'll just call b, and we'll create a new list and assign it to b. The list starts out empty, and we want to iterate through um, all the elements in the list from, from index start to end. We, we're not gonna use a for each loop. That's, you know, if you're gonna iterate through an entire list, it makes sense generally to use a for each loop. It's more convenient, but because we wanna go only through a sub range and we're not necessarily going through the whole list, um, then it makes sense to use a for inc, uh, where we can specify the start index and the end in the index. Okay, so what we then do in the loop is given you know, we, we get the element at index i of a, and we tack it on to the end of the list b with push. So we're pushing to b the, uh, an item from a. So once we get to this loop, that should be every, everything we need. We, b has been, it started out empty, but each time through the loop, we're adding another thing to it. And by the time we get through the loop, it now represents that subrange specified by the caller of the function. So then we're done and we just return b, and that's the end of this function. So another very common thing we want to be able to do in code is to take a list of strings and join all of those strings, as we say, into one string, um, like going through them all, concatenating them all together. Uh, but then often when we concatenate these strings together, we want to be able to say that in between all of them is some other string. So we have the join function here. We specify a list of strings, which we call strings here, and then a separator string. And if you look at the, the example usages down here, we have our list, which is a, b, and then cat and dog. If we join a, join the list with an empty string, an empty separator string, we get back a, b, c, cat, dog with no spaces in between, nothing in between. If we have join a with a, a string with a single space here, that's what this is, then we get back a string with all the strings of the list joined together, but with spaces in between. Here, the separator is comma space, and so you see comma spaces, it looks like a comma separated list. And then just for an arbitrary, another example, just two dots in between, and here you go. So looking at the logic, uh, we're going to have two variables, s and last index. We'll explain them in a second. Uh, but first thing we do is we check if the length of strings is zero. If there are no strings in the strings list, then we're just going to return an empty string. We'll treat that sort of as a special case. And then we're going to assign to s an empty string, because in the logic here, we're going to go through the elements of strings and build up s each time through by concatenating whatever s currently has and then assigning that to s. It's gonna be very similar logic to what we did up here where we have this empty list and each time through the loop we're, we're building up the list by pushing another thing to it. So logically it's the same thing down here. And we're, we save to last index the, the length of the string minus one because it just works out if you, as you see, we're using it in two places. That's why I created a variable. Without the variable here, I'd have to, I mean, we could have written that way. We could have just like plugged this in, in place, but I thought that looked a little ugly. So I created a variable. And anyway, so the reason we need last index here is because first thing we need to do is we need to go through all the strings of the list, except for the last one. We need to treat the last string of this list, like dog here, as a special case, because we want to tack the separator we want to put the separator after each one of the strings except for the last one. So that, that last string is a special case. So we need to, to iterate through all of the lists, uh, all the strings in the list except the last one. What I've done is I've uh, used sublist to get another list 
which is just like strings, but has but is missing that last element. So this loop here is going to iterate through all the element, all the strings except the last one. And each time through, we're going to concatenate what S is currently. Tack on uh, V here is the string from the list of strings, and then the separator, and then that's the new S. So by the time we get done here, S will be the joining of all of the strings with the separator except for the last string. That's the missing piece. And so what we do in the final statement here is we're going to take what S is currently, which is missing that last element, and the last element and concatenate them together, and that's our return value. So that's the join function. So very much like we want to take a list and sometimes extract out a sublist, a, a portion of elements, a range of elements from the list. Uh, we want to do the same thing with a string where we extract out another string, which is made up of some range of characters within the larger string. So uh, for that purpose, we create a function called substr, as in substring. And here, for example, we call it with hello world with index zero up to, but not including index four, then we get back hell. Um, and if we do so with index three to nine, then it gets us back low comma space were. That's six characters starting at index three up to, but not including index nine. And then if we call hello world with indexes five and six, um, then we get back comma, because that's index five right here, right? Yeah, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Um, okay. And looking at the logic here, we create a local variable called chars. And we're introducing a new operator here. We didn't talk about this before. The charless operator, given a string, returns a list of strings where each string is a character of the input string. So given hello world, you'd get back a, a list where the first string is just a single character, capital H. The second is the single character, lowercase e. The third is just a single character, lowercase l, etc. right? So that's then stored in chars. And we want to get a subrange of that, so we call, uh, call the sublist function we defined before, pass it chars, and we want everything up from start, at start, up to, but not including end. And we're going to store the result of that also in chars. We're going to clobber the, the previous list stored in chars with this new list. And then finally, we want to take all those strings and join them together so we get a single string, right? So we call join with chars. Oops, and I forgot. There should be an empty uh, string for the separator. There we go, that's now proper. Okay, now there's a debatable point of style here about whether we need the local variable chars at all. What you could do is you could take um, this expression, this operation, and plug it in where chars is used in the next line, and it would logically be the same. So we don't really need this line by itself at all. We can get rid of that assignment. Um, and so it would look like this. And I should fix the code up here so it's correct. There we go. Um, and then we could do the same thing here. We could take this and instead of assigning it to a variable, just, you know, it's only used in one place later on. So we could just plug it in right there and the result would look like this, except we need to now tack on there. Now this is correct. Yeah, so on the one hand, this is more compact. On the other hand, you might look at this and say, well, that's uh, kind of complicated for a single line of code. Uh, I would look at this and say, you know, there's not really bad at all. Um, but if you did have a, a line that was too long, then you would do th the same thing we did up here, where you, you like take these intermediate operations, assign the results to variables, so that you can spread the work onto to multiple lines. That's a, a very common thing to do with variables. Um, just be clear, like strictly speaking, we don't really need them. You could just put this all in one line. Anyway, so. Another thing we want to do with strings is given a string, we want to search for a substring, see if it's found somewhere within the first string, and if so, we want to know where, what index uh, the, that substring is found. So we define a function called index, which does this. It takes a string s and a substring ss, and it looks for ss somewhere in s and gives us back the index of where it's found. Uh, so here, for example, if we call index with hello world and hell, uh, well, hell, there is a match inside Hello World. This, the sequence of characters does occur there, starting at index zero. So we get back index zero. Um, if we look for hell lowercase h, well, lowercase h and capital H are not the same character. So there actually is no match anywhere in the substring. Uh, index will then give you back negative one. That's the convention to, to return negative one, indicating 
that there's no match. Um, and then for world, well, there is a match starting at index, what is that, uh, five, six, seven? Yeah, that's index seven. Um, and then if we look for O, uh, you can the substring can just be a single character, that's valid. And in this case, well, there's actually multiple matches. There's index four and there's index, let's see, five, six, seven, eight, yeah, index eight. So the question is, which one does it give you back? Well, it searches from the front, so it gives you back always the first match if there are multiple matches. In some cases, you might want to have a, another function, like say called index all, which will find all matches within a, a string and re would return a list of numbers instead of just a single number. But uh, the index function just returns the first match from the left. You also might want another function that searches from the end of the string and gives you, if there's multiple matches, it gives you the, the one at the end. Um, I don't know, maybe you call that like R index as in like right index. Anyway, uh, looking at the logic of the function, we're going to create a uh, local variable SS2. Uh, th this is very debatable. People complain that you shouldn't have variables with uh, numbers to distinguish them because we also have SS and now we have SS2. That is generally bad style, but I would say in this case, it's a very short function. There's really not anything obvious that you would call the, this variable anyway. What, what else you would call it? It's just another substring, so I'm calling it SS2. Uh, that's generally something you want to avoid, in, particularly in longer functions where your variables like have to have meaning across a, a larger context, and it can get confusing if you have a bunch of uh, short variable names that are just have numbers after them. But I think it's cool in this case. Anyway, so the logic of what we're doing here is we're going to have a loop where i iterates from zero up to, but not including, the increment of subtracting length of uh, the, the substring from the length of the, the larger string. Um, and yes, we are going to assume that the substring is smaller than s. Uh, maybe we shouldn't actually, we probably should. Uh, actually, we'll, what would happen in that case? What would happen? Um, actually, no, yeah. If, if that were the case, if our substring is longer than the, the string itself, well, then obviously there can't be a, a substring match. We want to get back negative one. So if say substring were 10 and s were nine, the, uh, then if the length of the string were nine, this would be negative one, you increment it to zero, and then we'd go incrementing from i is zero up to, but not including zero. So it would never iterate because i would already be equal to the end index. So that would actually work. That would actually be okay. Anyway, the reason for this complex logic is we're not, um, we're not gonna iterate through all the characters of the string. We only wanna, st we wanna start at index zero and keep going um, but we, we stop once we're at the last index where there could possibly be a match. If our substring is four characters long, then once we get to the index where there are only four characters left, that's the last thing we check. It doesn't make sense to keep going past that. And in fact, in this case, because in the, in the loop here, we're going to call substring. We didn't, we didn't talk about this before, but the way we wrote the substring function is if, if we specify an end index, which is, or a start index, that's is outside the bounds of the string, if it's, you know, if you have a five character string, you specify an index 10, that's outside the bounds. Well, substring is going to fail and it's going to terminate our program. Actually, it's, it's a bad operation. So we want to avoid ever calling substring with indexes that aren't valid for the string. So for that reason, and also to avoid unnecessary work, instead of iterating through all the indexes of the first string, instead of just going up to the length of S, we are going to do all this where, so, so here's, here's, here's the logic. So this is, um, Hello world is 13 characters, world is five characters. Subtract five from 13, you get eight. Okay, so if we're incrementing up to, but not including index eight, we would stop at index seven, which would be, let's see, five, six, seven. We'd be stopping here, when we want to stop actually at the O. It's a bad example, I know it's confusing. We want to stop at the point at the index where there are five characters left, right? So it actually, it's actually one greater than the length, uh, than the subtracting length of SS from S. That's why we have the ink here. So now we have i, which is gonna iterate through, you know, in this example from here all the way through r. And each time it iterates, we wanna get the substring, the, the, in this case, the four character substring um, at the, starting at the position at i. So we're gonna get the substring of s starting at i, but then the end position, that also changes along with i. That's whatever the length of the substring is plus i. That's what we're going. That's the substring we're going to check. So the first time through, uh, here, here in this example for world, uh, 
we would get this substring of the first five characters. And then a second iteration loop where i is one, we get this substring of characters. And third time through, we get this substring of characters, okay? That's what's being stored in SS2, okay? And so with that substring, we then check if it's equal to SS, the substring we're looking for. If so, then we found a match and we want to return whatever i is. Uh, so in this first example, you know, first time through i is zero, we get the substring and hey, it's equal to SS. So we return zero, we return i. Otherwise, what's going to happen is just we keep going, we go through all the, the indexes of the string up to the point where the substring is equal to the, the number of remaining characters. And we're not going to find a match, so this condition is never going to be true. The loop will end and, okay, it turns out we went through the whole thing, match was not found, so it, mu it must not be there. So we return negative one. So the logic of this one is slightly tricky. You just have to keep in mind that you don't want to iterate through the entire original string. That's that's what all this complication is. Otherwise, it's not horribly complicated. Uh, arguably, you might want to uh, remove the, the use of this other variable. We don't really need it. Again, we can do the same trick. We can just take this expression, plug it in where SS2 is used because it's only used in one place. And so we could just write the code this way and it would function exactly the same. And arguably this is easier to understand because you don't have to think about what does SS2 mean? What is its role? There, there are trade-offs here. You know, in, in some cases, introducing uh, variables that you don't strictly need. On the one hand, maybe it helps you make individual lines easier to look at, easier to read. But on the other hand, you're introducing a new thing with a name and you have the, the reader of your code has to think, well, what is that about? And they have to worry about what might happen to that variable as the as particularly in a longer function, you has to worry you have to worry about what might be done with that variable over many lines potentially. In this case, I don't really have a strong preference. I think they're about equal in terms of readability. On the one hand, this is a little complicated, but then over here you have to introduce another variable, and, and I always I find it a little displeasing. So weighing the trade-offs, I think they come out about the same. Now, another objection to this function is that it's really not the most efficient way to implement this uh, index operation because, well, the main culprit is the substr function because we're extracting out a whole substring, which in fact, the way we implemented the substring function is not the most efficient in the world because we're like creating a list, creating a, a, another list from that and then join it into a string. And yeah, so, um, I, I mean, we don't have to sweat uh, efficiency details, certainly at this stage of your programming education. I mean, this is an educational language and we're doing trivial exercises, but I do want to give you a sense of down the line when you do start writing real code, you might want to avoid glaring inefficiencies like what we're doing here. So our alternate implementation of index looks like this. Uh, we're introducing a variable match, which we'll talk about in a second. And first thing we do is we take the string and the substring and we get their char lists. In fact, we don't, we're not going to need the string and the substrings themselves. We just want their, their char lists because we're going to take the corresponding characters, individual characters and compare them against each other. Um, so the outer loop here looks exactly the same as in our original implementation. It's going up to the position from zero up to the last possible position where the substring might be found. That's what we're doing. But then we're not using substr. Um, instead, we set match to be true. We're going to go through all the characters of SS. We'll get it as CH here. And then if we find a case where it's not equal to the corresponding character of the, of the full string, then we know we don't have a match. We're done for this checking that particular position. So, okay, to be clear here, exactly. J will be the index of SS. So if SS is five characters long, each in the center loop, J goes to zero through four, right? And it does that every time, you know, every time we go in the outer loop, this inner loop J is always gonna go zero through four. So we wanna uh, get the character, which is at the corresponding position of the substring in the full string. So that's what this is about. We're taking whatever I is, adding it to J, and that gets us the, the corresponding character of the, of the full string. The original string is now S here, which is a char list. It's a list of individual character strings. So we're going to compare it against CH. And if they're not equal, that's what any, any Q, I don't know if we mentioned this before, any Q is just a convenience. It's an equality operation, but logically inverted. So if these things are not equal, it returns true. 
So if we if we see that they're not equal, then we set match to false. We break out of the loop. I don't think we've mentioned break statements either. Um, a break statement is a convenience that lets us bail out of a loop early. Normally a loop, you know, there's a condition, something governing how many times it's going to iterate. Well, sometimes you just want to say, I don't care, just end the loop right now. That's what a break statement says. So because this break statement is inside this for each loop, it's going to break, if executed, it'll stop uh, execution of the for each. Uh, execution will just jump from here to whatever's after the loop. In this case, it jumps down to this if statement. So that's break. It, uh, it's quite convenient in some cases. Uh, so when we get down here, if this loop iterates and checks every character of the substring to the corresponding position in the original string, and they're all equal, then this condition is never going to be true. Match will never be set to false. It'll still be true. And so when we get down here, it'll, hey, we found our match. And so then we return I. Otherwise, if there if it's not a match, then match will have been set to false, will have broken out of the loop, and we get down here, this is going to be false. And we go on to the next uh, index of the full string. Anyway, so that's an alternate way of implementing index. And uh, when it comes to performance, you always have to be careful about making these judgments. Uh, you have to really measure things to know if you're making things better or worse. But my guess is that this version would be considerably more efficient than the original version we had because it's only creating two lists. It's not using uh, char list and join a bunch. So it's almost certainly going to be more efficient. Anyway, moving on. So another thing you might want to do with a string is test whether it contains uh, one or more certain characters. And for that, we have a contains any function which takes a string and then also a list of strings where those strings should be individual characters, single character strings. And so here down in this example, we have contains any with hello world. We want to see if that string contains any character in this string, QWERTY. So we get a list of characters from QWERTY and this call will be true because E is here, uh, right here. And also R is also found there in world. Um, so that's true. Uh, but then if we have ZXCV, if we try and find the, any one of those characters in Hello World, where it's, none of those are found, so we get false. Uh, and then here we're testing if just an exclamation mark by itself is somewhere in the string. And be clear, this is a single character string already, but the function is expecting a list of strings. So even if you're looking for just one character, you still have to have a list of strings, not a string passed in. Um, the logic here is quite simple. We're just... Uh, Iterating through all of the characters of the outer list. Um, so S is a string, right? And we want to get the individual characters. So we create a char list, right? So each time through, CH will be a character of the outer string, of, of, the, of the main string we're searching through. Uh, and then we need to test. We, we want to get the individual characters from the char list, uh, from chars. So we iterate through all of those chars. We call them CH2. We're just trying to find any match whatsoever, right? So the first time we find a match between CH and CH2, we know we're done. So we just return true. So if we get through uh, this outer loop and we haven't returned true, then we know that there's no match. And so we return false. For our last exercise, something we might want to do with strings is to trim them, as we say, which means to hack off certain characters found at the beginning of the string and at the end of the string. Most commonly, you want to get rid of leading spaces and trailing spaces, but sometimes you want to get rid of other kinds of characters. So instead of just having a function that hacks off spaces, we'll uh, generalize the, the solution to uh, work for other kinds of characters. So the way we, the, the function works is it's expecting a string, which we want to trim, and a so-called cut set, which is an individual string, but uh, first thing we do in the cut set is um, we create a char list out of it because we just want to consider the individual characters. Um, so looking down here, uh, the first example, trim, it's a little hard to look at because the, be, be clear, this is the first string and then this is the second. And the, the cut set string is just a single space character. So we want to trim from this first string all of the spaces from the beginning and the end. Uh, and so the result is hello world with no spaces around it. Whereas here, if we're trimming E space exclamation mark H, 
then we're going to hack off from the beginning everything, all the characters that, that are in the cut set. So we're going to hack all this stuff off. And going from the end, we're going to hack everything off up to the D. So we get back low world. Uh, in this last example, we're, we're hacking everything off the same deal, except we're not hacking off spaces. And well, we get back the same original string, because if you, if you go from the beginning and stop when you encounter something that's not one of these characters, well, space is not one of those characters, so we're done. Um, and if you work from the end, well, same deal. Uh, first character is a space, and a space is in the, in the cut set, so we don't actually cut anything in that case. We don't trim anything. So looking at the logic, this is probably the most complicated function so far. Our strategy is that we're going to search from the start until we find a character which is not in the cut set. And then we're going to search from the end and find the position of the first character that's not in the cut set. Once we have those two numbers, start and end, we have, we have two local variables, start and end. And what we're trying to do is find what the start and end should be. Once we have those numbers, then we can get a substring of S. And that's our result. At that point, we know where to cut, and so we use substr to uh, get this string. Like in this first example, you want to extract out everything after the spaces, in between the spaces. So what we're going to do when we search from the start is we're going to iterate from 0 up to, but not including, the length of s, so the length of the full string. And inside here, we'll first I'll draw your attention to get char is another operator we haven't talked about before. It just uh, given a string it gets us an individual character from that string. It's like substr, but it only gets you a single character string instead of a substring. And it's built into the language. Anyway, so for each character, we want to see, we're starting from the left. We want to see if like this first character is match matches anything in the cut set. So we're going to use contains any, which, which we do, just defined um, to see if this string, the individual character of the, the full string, is matching anything in the cut set, any of the individual characters in the cut set. And if not, if we encounter a character which is not in the cut set, then we know we're done. We found the start of the part of the string we want to keep. And so we assign start to whatever value of i is, and we break out of the loop because we're done. Now it's possible in this first loop that what if the string you're, you're trimming consists entirely of characters in the cut set. So you're going to trim everything. Well, in that special case, uh, we'll have iterated through this full list and we won't have found a start at all. There is no start. And so start will still be nil because start hasn't been assigned anything yet. And so we check if start is equal to nil. And if so, we know we're done and we're going to return early out of the function. We're going to say, oh, well, you're going to return an empty string. So we're trimming the whole thing. We're trimming the whole string. And so we return just an empty string. Otherwise, assuming start has been assigned some number and it's not nil, then we're going to continue on and we're going to start searching from the end. And so now we need to iterate backwards through the string. So that's why we have for deck. So we can go backwards and we're going to have another counter i starting at 1 less than len s. The first value of i is going to be whatever is len s minus 1. And then we're going to keep going through the value 0. We're going to keep decrementing until we get to negative 1 in effect. And so we're effectively going through the string backwards, right to left. And the logic is exactly the same, except when we find a character that's not in the cut set, then we set end to whatever the value of i is plus one. Because when we set end, because it's going to be used down here, you know, if this exclamation mark in this example is the last character of what's supposed to be included in the string, then we want that position plus one when we call substr, right? Because substr, that last index, is one past the character we keep. Anyway, so now we have our start and end. And last thing to do, we just need to get a substring from s from start up to but not including end. So that's the trim function, and that's the last example for this video. I just want to quickly remind you that we snuck in some new stuff, uh, the char list operator and the get char operator, and also break statements. Those are things we hadn't discussed in the previous video at all. Um, next video is going to cover uh, the number guessing game and a hangman game. So these are going to actually be interactive programs where at the console, at least, you'll type input, hit enter, and your program will process your input and spit out output in response. And that's going to be next time.